Yeah, well, thank you. Okay, and, so uh, today we have uh, Adrian again talking about uh, graph theoretical approach to free fermi solvability. So please, Adrian. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thanks once again for um, the invitation to speak today. I'm going to be speaking or continuing the lectures um, from last time on a graph theoretic approach to free fermi solvability. Uh, so just to maybe uh, recap um, what we uh, spoke about last time. So um, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about um, this uh, generalization of the jordan Wigner transformation. And uh, this is a, formula, uh, a formalism uh, where generalizations of the jordan Wigner transformation can be captured by uh, frustration graphs called line graphs, when the frustration graph of the Hamiltonian is a line graph. Um, and then uh, today, uh, I'll talk about how this relates uh, to a graph theoretic characterization for the four fermion model, um, which is a model given by Fenley. Uh, and I'll explain what that is. And um, yeah, so this is uh, naturally related to a characterization of what are called even whole claw free graphs. Okay, so uh, just to kind of restate what I mean by um, a generalized jordan Wigner transformation. Is it relates to a Hamiltonian which has a decomposition of the following form, a spin Hamiltonian. So H can be written as a sum on a Z2 bit string. So Y is a Z2 bit string uh, describing or specifying a symmetric subspace. And uh, within each symmetric subspace, we have a sum over uh, single particle energies, epsilon J, uh, which are also uh, uh, depend on Y. And so this is a classical paramagnet Hamiltonian over each um, symmetric subspace. And this is possible in a certain basis. Um, and so, right, so this Y describes a symmetric subspace. And this is sort of the uh, free fermion part. And I put it in quotes because, uh, well, this decomposition is quite general, but what is interesting um, is kind of the way that uh, when you can find decompositions like this, that they relate to kind of the physics of the model uh, in a physical or a local basis. Uh, so as I said, um, it's possible when uh, the frustration graph is a line graph of some other graph called the root graph. And uh, so, right, so this is the frustration graph. And I won't write the full definition here again, but um, is the graph of Pauli terms in the Hamiltonian in the given basis, uh, where terms that are um, terms correspond to vertices in this graph and uh, their neighboring if the terms anti-commute in, in the basis given. Um, and then uh, the next sort of important point to remember um, is that these models, when the when the frustration graph is the line graph, always come with a set of symmetries. And these are uh, come in two sort of flavors, I guess, cycles of the root graph. These are kind of the non-trivial symmetries. Um, and these, uh, the eigenvalues of these specify Y. So eigenvalues uh, specify Y, the bit string. And um, there are 
for uh, a graph with uh, m edges and vertices and c components. There's m minus n plus c independent uh, symmetries, independent cycles, I mean, as edge subsets of the root graph, independent in, in that sense. And uh, the other thing is that you can capture the capture the uh, symmetry subspace by writing down an orientation on the graph or specifying an orientation. Okay. Um, and then the second flavor is the parity symmetry. And uh, so as I said, the, the first um, symmetry is a, is a graph theoretic structure. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna specify this by its graph theoretic structure as well. Uh, this is a T join of R, which is kind of a uh, possibly less well-known uh, graph theoretic structure, but it is a subset of edges. Um, yeah, it's an edge subset. in which every vertex has odd degree. It's kind of loosely stated, but um, we'll see kind of a little bit what that means. And uh, this corresponds to the parity symmetry of the Hamiltonian, which is a, a very well-known symmetry of free fermion models. Right. right. And then, um, so, and then finally, uh, I just want to remind that there are two characterizations that we talked about. Um, there's the click, uh, and this was decomposition characterization. This is to do given by Krauss in 1943, and the forbidden subgraph characterization. Well, actually, we'll see this one on the next page, I believe. Yes. So uh, the forbidden subgraph characterization, and this is given by JK in 1970. Um, so I'll return to the to the Krauss uh, characterization momentarily, but uh, what I'll just say about the forbidden subgraph characterization is that there's a set of nine forbidden subgraphs um, such that uh, if any subset of vertices in the frustration graph induces one of these nine forbidden subgraphs, then the graph globally is not a line graph. Um, so these can kind of be uh, intuitively thought of as the uh, local kind of graph theoretic obstructions, obstructions to uh, free fermion solvability. Um, there's a little bit of nuance to that um, that you can get around, but for the most part, uh, these are the obstructions to uh, sort of, um, I guess, uh, generalized jordan Wigner free fermion solvability, which is generator to generator free fermion solvability. Um, so in this lecture, we'll talk about um, a form of free fermion solvability that goes beyond uh, generator to generator. So instead of mapping each term in the Hamiltonian to a, uh, a fixed free fermion term, um, we're going to talk about transformations that are more non-local. Uh, so they map the entire Hamiltonian as one object to uh, a free fermion Hamiltonian. Um, and sort of the important graph uh, for this characterization will be these two. So um, the claw is an important one. And uh, we're going to, while it doesn't get directly involved, we'll talk a lot about this example because this is sort of the example that uh, illustrates this. So, oops, sorry, not to undo that. Anyway, so we have two forbidden subgraphs that we're sort of going to be focusing on. Um, right. And then 
just to kind of recap at the very end, um, maybe I rushed through this a little bit, um, but these graph theory characterizations uh, capture a wide um, variety of models. So uh, here are some, here are the models I uh, spoke about a little bit, um, sort of listed in approximate order of dimensionality. So uh, the 1D general XY model is maybe the most commonly known, uh, exactly solvable by free fermion Hamiltonian by the George Wigner transformation. Uh, in our paper, we introduced a model called the Sierpinski Hanoi model, which is a model defined on the uh, Sierpinski uh, gasket, and it has uh, it's, it's a fractal, so it's somewhere maybe in between one and two dimensions. Um, in uh, Kataev's paper in 2006, he introduced the Kataev honeycomb model. Um, this is a genuinely 2D model with an extensive number of cycle symmetries. Um, and then uh, other models have been proposed. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one, uh, the frustrated hexagonal gauge 3D color code um, proposed by Joachim O'Connor, Roberts, Bartlett, and Preskill uh, in 2009 uh, at a conference. Um, and so, right, so basically the point is that um, these models kind of illustrate sort of the, uh, or rather I should say uh, the graph theory is sort of general enough to capture um, models with a range of dimensionality from uh, 1D up to 3D and, and sort of that's the, uh, to, to a large extent, the strength of this method is really what it uh, depends on is kind of the microscopic uh, interconnectivity of um, a graph, but uh, can instead capture um, models with a lot of different course topology. And so these things can be related, but um, in this case, it happens to be the case that models from one to three dimensions uh, are all captured and beyond. Um, okay, so uh, first I'm going to talk about transfer matrices and I'm going uh, to give- Excuse um, me, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, before we move on, just uh, want to ask, uh, just to be sure that uh, the, the root graph of the line graph that, that we, uh, we have found, it, it has, I remember last time you mentioned that it, it has some kind of physical meaning, right? So it, it means that right. basically the, how, how the fermions are hopping in a sense after the, the generalized Jordan Wigner transformation, we, we would expect to, to see like some kind of fermions hopping on this root graph. Is, is it true? Or? That's right. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. So in the, maybe the two kind of like helpful cases to look at are the first and third of these. So um, the, the root graph indeed is the, you can kind of think of as the, the fermion hopping graph, the physical sites on which the fermions hop. Um, for the general XY model, it's the, uh, it's a 1D chain with uh, nearest neighbor couplings and also um, next and next next nearest neighbor couplings. So it has up to range, I guess, three uh, couplings. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, in the Kataya honeycomb model, um, the uh, root graph is uh, the honeycomb lattice itself. So um, the, the honeycomb model has the property that uh, as a, in the qubit interaction picture, um, its terms all mutually anti-commute at a qubit. And so on a honeycomb lattice, uh, the frustration graph is actually just the line graph again of the honeycomb graph. And so you have fermion popping on a honeycomb lattice again. Um, and for the he uh, frustrated hexagonal 3D gauge color code, um, well, it turns out actually that these uh, anti-commuting um, XZ faces, uh, while the qubit model is actually genuinely 3D, um, the, the sort of effective free fermion model decouples into a sequence of uh, disconnected 1D chains mm -hmm. um, because these say these blue faces uh, only anti-commute with the other blue faces uh, of the opposite pally type where they share a vertex. And so, uh, and, and when, when they share more than one vertex, they commute. So you can see at the sort of three-way intersection between the red, green, and blue, uh, I guess that would be this vertex, this kind of central vertex here. Um, these, uh, the red, green, and uh, blue faces uh, each share two qubits. Um, so those commute. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, right, so today I'm going to talk about a slightly different way of approaching uh, free fermion solvability through what are called transfer matrices. So, um, before getting into what transfer matrices, sort of the graph theoretic perspective of transfer matrices that um, I tend to think of uh, with these, um, I'm going to just introduce some definitions. So, uh, some more graph theoretic definitions. So, a uh, an L matching of a graph is a subset of edges. It's an edge subset of a graph, say G, C is an edge subset M. Um, such that every vertex, oops, instead of the edge set, such that every vertex in M is incident to at most one edge. So uh, maybe familiar with perfect matching, um, edge subset of L edges. Um, yeah, with L edges. So perfect matching is one where every uh, vertex in the graph is incident to exactly one edge. Um, and so, right, so if uh, the number of vertices in the graph is even, uh, a perfect matching uh, is a, a V on two matching. And uh, another important sort of property that we'll use is that the symmetric difference between matching uh, as uh, edge subsets yields uh, subgraphs of degree um, at most two, which is to say, um, And I'll call this subgraph G of say M metric difference with M prime of degree most two. So uh, that's to say that this graph is either a set of um, disconnected edges, uh, paths, or cycles. Um, um, the cycles are also of even length because uh, if so, right, uh, if it's a symmetric difference between two matchings, then the, then the edges in the symmetric difference are bicolorable. And so um, the cycles must be even length because odd length cycles are not by edge bicolorable. So for example, um, let's just look at a quick uh, four cycle example. So, um, Two exactly two matching, two perfect matching. Um, so of course it has four one matchings, which are the four edges of the graph, and it has um, two perfect matchings, which are the sort of the two vertex disjoint edges. And uh, the symmetric difference between them is the entire cycle. So because the two edges, uh, two perfect matchings are disjoint, um, that gives the entire thing. Um, okay, so. The other concept we'll need or definition is uh, the Fafian, which is 
a polynomial. So uh, I'm going to talk about the Fafian of an anti-symmetric weighted uh, skew adjacency matrix. So um, yeah, these are some terms called skew adjacency matrices or just adjacency matrices of uh, oriented graphs or skew oriented graphs. Sigma on uh, so sigma specifies the orientation. I'll call this VE on two L vertices. And uh, this, this matrix I will call uh, H. So So the Fafian of H, skew adjacent to matrix H, Fafian of H is the sum of all L matching, sum over all L matching in the graph, uh, M. Sign factor minus one to the n, and then the product of all vertices, sorry, all edges in M with indices ordered. So uh, with the matrix element. Um, and then the sign factor. is the sign of the permutation. Uh, in this case, it's comes two uh, vertices. Two L minus one, two L, J L, K L. Right. So it's the sign of the permutation which takes uh, the consecutive integers from 1 to 2L to the uh, to an edge set that um, where where edges in the matching are consecutive and uh, they're also ordered by the indices. And um, note that it doesn't matter what the order of the actual edges is because if I uh, permute say J1K1 with JLKL um, anything that any swaps that I do to uh, do that permutation uh, will incur two minus signs because J and K uh, both are swapped. So um, the order of this edge, the order of the edges doesn't matter, but uh, it is important that we fix J and K to be ordered. Um, and so that's kind of a fiducial sign choice for each one. And this kind of counts uh, sort of a parity of the number of interleavings of uh, uh, vertex indices. So if I have something like one, three, two, four, that's going to require one switch to bring it to one, two, three, four. Um, and so, right, so this is the Fafian. Um, and this will be an important. And uh, just some properties of this. Um, so if uh, H has odd dimension, then the Fafian is zero. Uh, I guess odd, H has odd dimension or odd size. And then uh, it's a well-known property of the Fafian that the determinant of H is the Fafian of H squared. 
And uh, you know, one of these, uh, the, the former of these properties follows from the latter because if H uh, has odd dimension, then uh, it has a zero eigenvalue. And uh, this implies that its determinant is also zero. So tapping squared of H is all, the tapping of zero is zero and tapping squared of H is zero. Or maybe I should have said, yeah, the, the form of these is implied by the latter. And then let me just make a new page. Um, So the characteristic polynomial of H So I'm going to use this as this is what we need to solve in order to obtain the single particle energies of our free fermion Hamiltonian. Um, and I'm going to define it in kind of a kind of a special uh, convention. So I'm going to multiply H by the imaginary constant i, um, and that's going to make the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of ih are strictly real because uh, eigenvalues of h are purely imaginary and come in complex conjugate pairs. And I'm going to put uh, the indeterminate variable, which I'm going to call u, um, that's going to go on h itself. So, um, right, so, uh, so, the, so an opposite convention to what you sometimes see where u is on the identity factor, but uh, in this case, I'm going to put it on the um, on the matrix factor, matrix term. And so this is the sum of all subsets, I'll call them alpha, of 2L, uh, where 2L again is the size of the uh, matrix. And I'm going to set the size of alpha equal to K. Um, so it's the sum over all K, but uh, Defining k as the size of alpha, um, and this gives minus i u to the k times the determinant of the alpha by alpha submatrix of H. So the subset, sub, the rows and columns of H specified by the subset alpha. And so, uh, just for an example, I'm going to bring down this graph again. So suppose I've chosen H to be the following matrix. And all other elements in this matrix are zero. Then the determinant of i of the identity minus the IUH, the characteristic polynomial of H, is the identity, sorry, it's one, uh, minus u squared. And then, so this is the sum of all, uh, well, all one by one determinants of H vanish. So um, the next, all one by one principal minors of H vanish. So the next uh, largest one is all two by two matrices. Um, and uh, the um, determinants of these, for example, uh, say this block, that's uh, A squared because it's minus A times minus A. Um, so you get the sum of all the uh, non-zero elements of H here. And then a contribution from the determinant of the entire thing. Um, and what we'll use here is the fact that the determinant of this is the Fapian. Um, so it's Fapian squared, I should say. So 
uh, let me label the vertices as one, two, three, four. So you have the one, two, three, four matching. Plus the one, three, two, four matching. You can kind of a little bit loose with that notation. But hopefully that's clear. So these are the uh, these are the um, contributions from each of the the two matchings in this in this graph. And um, so what we get is so we have to square it because it's the square of the Fafian. Um, and so what we have is the original thing, the original uh, terms we wrote down. This is u to the fourth ac minus cd quantity squared. So yeah, I'm going to say this is a, uh, this is C, D, and B. And um, you have a minus sign from the fact that you have one, three, two, four. You have one swap necessary to um, to uh, sort that. And this is what you have. Okay, so why did I say this? Um, so what's important to note is that there are contributions to the characteristic polynomial of H from what are called the even linear subgraphs. So these are isolated edges. Um, These consist of isolated edges. And cycles, even cycles. Technically even central cycles. Um, central cycle is one where if I remove that cycle, the remaining graph is a perfect matching. Um, so remove all vertices into that cycle. And so, right, so we see that we have all these a squared, b squared, c squared, d squared terms. These are all uh, single edges. a squared, c squared is also an even linear subgraph. It's a pair of edges. c squared, d squared is similar. And we also have a contribution from uh, a, c, b, d, which is the cycle of the graph. And uh, also what's important to note is that if I were to change the orientation of this cycle, so, uh, the orientation I'm going to say is specified by um, the sign of the matrix above the main diagonal. Sorry, okay. Um, so yeah, what I mean by that is uh, assuming A, B, C, and D without loss of generality are all are all non-negative, um, then uh, I'm going to orient the edge according to the um, Sorry, I'm going to choose a sign on the matrix element according to the orientation of the edge if the orientation is in the direction of the ordering of the vertices. So in this case, suppose A is non-negative, um, then I'm going to orient this edge from one to two, this edge from two to three, uh, this edge from three to four, and then um, this edge from one to four. So uh, this is what's called an oddly oriented cycle because um, as I go around the even cycle, uh, I see three edges. In this case, suppose I go this way one, two, three. Three edges going with me. 
and then one edge that goes against the direction that I go in. And the parity of this number, oh, sorry about that. The parity of this number is uh, independent of the direction I choose. Um, but uh, as long as the cycle is even. So uh, that's how I sort of uh, am free to choose the orientation that I want. Um, the, the only way that this is actually going to impact anything in terms of the eigenvalues of the matrix is in terms of this uh, cycle operator. And so if I happen to reverse the orientation of the cycle, by say setting V to minus V, um, then that doesn't change anything in this characteristic polynomial except for just this term. So uh, that will change that to a minus sign. Okay, or that to a plus sign, I should say. Um, okay, so what does this have to do with transfer matrices? So I'm going to now uh, define what I call the transfer matrix in graph theoretic terms. And I'm just thinking ahead. I'm going to give myself another new page. So that's to say T of U. The T will generally depend on the graph as well, but I'm going to drop um, the dependence on the graph for now. So when I define the transfer matrix, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now uh, think of this graph as describing a free fermion model. So uh, on each of the edges, I'm going to associate an operator, which is a quadratic operator uh, in terms of fermions. So say um, I associate uh, H sub C to, it's oriented from three to four. So I'm going to call it I gamma three gamma four. Um, and I'm also going to give it a coefficient, which is, I'll just call it C um, because I want it to be coincident with the notation above. Um, and, and in general, I'm going to associate uh, an operator to each edge of this graph, um, as we did in the line graph uh, formalism above, where uh, each coefficient has, um, sorry, where each operator is associated to the two vertices, the Myron modes on the two vertices incident to that edge, and the orientation is chosen, uh, as I said, and also with a generic coefficient that um, is uh, attached to these. So uh, then I'm going to define um, the transfer matrix as the sum over all matchings in the graph. The matchings M product. Uh, so I'm going to call a sort of generic edge E, define that as J, K in the matching. And uh, again, order J less than K. Actually, let me not do that yet. Um, and then say, this is minus u times h sub e. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to manipulate this transfer matrix using purely the algebraic um, properties of the uh, terms here. And um, so recall that uh, the, the edge operators anti-commute only if they're incident at a vertex. So uh, for example, H sub A and H sub C commute, but H sub A and H sub B anti-commute. Um, so uh, because this is the, uh, each factor in this uh, sum is a matching, uh, the operators within each factor commute with each other. So uh, say the, uh, you know, the perfect matching term uh, HA times HC, HA and HC commute with each other. So it doesn't matter what order I take that product, um, but the terms in this sum will generally not commute with each other.
And I'll just write this out a little bit more explicitly. Okay, and also in, uh, in anticipation of what's to come, <clears throat> I'm going to give each of these sums a name. And that name here is Q with an index uh, labeling the size. So here's what I call Q1 and call this term Q2. So uh, overall, define T as I minus u q1 plus u squared q2. Now, the other thing to note is that uh, q2 is actually an instance of the parity operator. So this is a parity symmetry of the free fermion model. Uh, if I map each of these factors to fermions, um, I'm going to see that, uh, say, HA times HC up to a sign uh, is the product of all fermions gamma 1, 2, 3, 4. So um, that's the parity symmetry operator. And so that uh, each term in Q2 commutes with uh, everything. Um, and in fact, so Q2 therefore commutes with Q1, and uh, also the identity commutes with everything. So uh, the sum of each of the terms in this sum also commutes. Yeah, so they generally won't commute with each other, but under certain special conditions, they will. And uh, it turns out that in the formalism that we're in, they actually always will. And I'll show that in a second. But um, so now I want to calculate P U and T of minus times T of minus U. And uh, what we're going to actually see is that this turns out to be up to the identity matrix factor, um, the characteristic polynomial of H. So uh, what this is to say is that the characteristic polynomial of this uh, matrix H has an operator expansion or an operator factorization um, in terms of uh, the sort of free fermion description of the model. Um, so to sort of explicitly show that, I think it's informative. Um, this is I plus U squared Q2. Minus uh, UQ1. And I've broken it up uh, this way. I plus U squared. U2 plus U1. All right. So here we have a difference of squares. Uh, this is I plus U squared U2 squared minus U squared Q1 squared. Okay. And um, just to, oh, just give myself another new page. Oh, I already did. Great. Um, just simplify a little bit. So Q1 squared is actually the Hamiltonian. It's the sum of all the terms, uh, all the single edge terms. And if these anti-commute, um, then Q, they vanish in the, in the square, Q1 squared. Um, 
So uh, the only contribution to Q1 squared is the square of all of the sum of squares of all the individual terms. That's A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. And uh, also the sum of products of all commuting pairs of terms, because I said they cancel if they anti-commute, but uh, if they commute, uh, they contribute to the sum. And um, this is in fact two times Q2. Oops. And then Q2 squared. Um, is the square of each of them. So that's a squared plus b squared, a squared c squared plus b squared d squared. And then there's going to also be the cross term. So uh, q2 is, is up to find up here. Um, and so, right, we have the, the self squaring terms and then the cross term, which is h a h c, h b h d. Okay, and so uh, when we expand the transfer matrix, square, what we see is we have I plus two U squared Q2 plus U to the fourth squared, which is uh, of Q2 squared, which is U to the fourth times this term. Two to the fourth plus two u to the fourth j d minus u squared q one squared. So that's minus U squared times A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. Minus two U squared Q2. And so we see that in fact, these terms cancel. And what we are left with up to an identity oops, is I minus U squared times the sum of all the coefficients squared plus U to the fourth. A squared, C squared plus B squared, D squared. Plus two U to the fourth, H A, H C, H B, H D. However, um, this final term is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian because this is the product this is the product of all terms around a cycle. So I can restrict to the subspace where this is plus or minus uh, a coefficient times the identity. Um, so I'm free to restrict this uh, and thereby restrict the whole thing onto a subspace. And uh, on the previous slide, we had that this was in fact had a minus sign. So uh, let's restrict it to its minus one subspace, just based on the orientation that we chose. Um, and so this gives, in this case, uh, the determinant of I minus I U H times the identity, but the identity coefficient is sort of irrelevant. So, um, right. So, what we found is that there is in fact a factorization of the characteristic polynomial 
uh, in terms of this thing called the transfer operator or transfer matrix. And the transfer matrix is defined in terms of graph theoretic uh, structures, um, the matchings of the graph. Um, and uh, can be sort of thought as a generating function, an operator value generating function on the matching. Um, and so what ended up happening was, uh, so I haven't proven it, but the Q operators will always compute in general. Um, but uh, in this case, I was a little bit um, you know, slick and used the fact that uh, one of the operators is always a symmetry, but even when it's not a symmetry, we're going to see that they commute. Um, and uh, what ended up also happening was the fact that the uh, products of these operators became um, a symmetry of the, of the Hamiltonian as well, uh, a cycle symmetry. And so uh, when we restrict onto a symmetric subspace of the entire Hamiltonian, uh, we recover the, the characteristic polynomial. And so what this says is that if uh, I'm at a value of u where um, the characteristic polynomial vanishes, um, then this is an eigenvalue of H up to, uh, uh, it's a reciprocal eigenvalue of H and up to um, multiplying by an imaginary constant. And uh, furthermore, um, we should also say that T sub U uh, has a kernel because it has Use an eigenvalue of h, or becomes non-invertible. I should say, yeah, it becomes non-invertible. It's also worth noting that uh, we'll also show that t u and t minus u anti commute. Um, I'll say it becomes singular. Okay. So what I'm going to do next, uh, if there are no questions, or if we also uh, don't want to break. Um, um, maybe here, I, I just want to mm -hmm. uh, be sure that I understand everything. So uh, suppose that we choose something we know, like, like I don't know, uh, Ising model. Uh, mm -hmm. Where there there's also like a transfer matrix approach, uh, you know, from even 1940s um, by Anzager or others, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder if, if that transfer matrix has anything to do with the one that you're constructing right now. So I believe so. So I can't. I haven't worked that explicitly, but what I can probably say is let's go back to the general X Y model. Um, so. Right, this is a, probably a fairly easy model to find all the matchings for, even though there may be uh, exponentially many matchings. Because, um, uh, you know, you can see that as soon as I say, like, take matchings which consist of half of the, you know, vertices or half the edges of the graph, um, there's a lot of those. But, um, so uh, there are again cycles here. Uh, in the case of this representation of the XY model, so when I say representation, what I mean is uh, a set of Pali operators which satisfy the same frustration graph, um, but uh, you know they may there may be different realizations of the same frustration graph by a different Pali operators. So that's what I'm going to call a representation, um, and uh, sometimes it's also called the representation of the quasi Clifford group. All right. So uh, when in this particular representation, it's the case that all of the um, cycle symmetries multiply to the identity. So a cycle here might be something like, uh, or mul multiply to a fixed eigenvalue, I should say. So there, in this case, you might have something like xj, let me highlight them. Um, so x uh, jj plus one, uh, yj xj plus one, yj yj plus one, Oh, is this what I wanted to show? No, I don't think so. Um, yeah, let's say uh, these four. So yy, 
x, x, z, and z. So uh, that is going to be um, a set of operators which uh, uh, anti-commute in a cycle, um, right? X, 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 y, y commute with each other, but both anti-commute with the z operators and the z operators uh, also commute with each other. So, um, but their product is uh, a fixed, is proportional to the identity, so not proportional to a general Pauli operator. And so that's fixed. Um, so what that basically says is that uh, this restriction onto the symmetric subspace is done for me uh, by the representation of the model. Like if I were to actually go ahead and multiply all of these operators out, um, then uh, what's going to end up happening is I'm already just going to have a, a, a factor of, of the identity here. Um, so then what I expect is that uh, there is going to be a nice factorization, a further factorization of the transfer matrix in terms of a local uh, matrix product operator description. Uh -huh. um, so I can't write that down off the top of my head, but uh -huh. um, that's probably what it's going to be. I see. Because, I mean, the, um, the nice thing about it is that there's kind of uh, so-called star triangle relations Right. Um, for example, in, in, in the 2D classicalizing case, and uh, seems that uh, this method using graph theory is not restricted to any dimension to, to some extent. That's true. And, and um, possibly there will be, let's say, uh, analogously new yeah, relations. I, I mean, in 3D, there, there are some known examples, so-called tetrahedron relation or something like this. Um, yeah, so it would be very interesting to you know, to observe it from, from, from this perspective. Yeah, um, I agree. And I yeah. think that, so um, here, you see that this definition in terms of matching is actually quite cumbersome because, uh, right, like, you know, even though it's mathematically rigorous, um, there can be, say, exponentially many terms mm -hmm. uh, in the sum, I believe. And um, that, you just can't write that down. So um but possibly if you're uh, kind of if if you're motivated by some physical models usually maybe these matchings are, are nicer such that uh, yeah oh, okay actually that is not true because uh the way how this is expand uh, the way how you're expanding your um uh, your uh transfer matrix in this way maybe you do not expect that this uh higher order uh, Q2, Q3, et cetera, to be local, right? E even though Q1 might no. be local. That's right. Because, um, yeah, because so sometimes you would like to expand it, maybe your transfer matrix has some other values, uh, because now we're mm -hmm. expanding kind of in the power of U. So maybe if right. at some other values, you might end up with somehow like the local charges, which is probably nicer to deal with. If you're, right. If you're on the lattice, um, that you know the dimension, so. So what, what I'll say is that um, for, for, so I'm going to generalize uh, a result um, given originally by Fenley uh, of the four fermion model, which is the 1D model. Um, and I probably won't go through the entire calculation today, but uh, what I will say is that uh, the transfer matrix for that model has a nice factorization, um, mm -hmm. which is a 1D factorization. And I believe the factors are called G sub J. And so each G sub J, is a function of u that's recursively defined in terms of the other g sub j. Um, I probably can't say what's top, off the top of my head what it is, but it's something like cosine uh, phi of j times u, uh, I believe. So this is times the identity plus sine phi of j. Uh, and I believe this will be h j divided by its coupling constant so it's something like this um and it may even be exactly that but um so each of the phi j's are defined in terms of the uh are defined recursively as the as the solution to i uh, believe a trigonometric equation and um it's it's this factorization that uh lets you do things a little bit more cleanly because uh well now it's it's actually explicitly local um, and 
uh, you can say put the model on periodic boundary conditions by um, writing this uh, operator as a matrix product form and then just uh, contracting the periodic boundary conditions that way. Um, so I agree, this is a really interesting uh, question, I think, um, to mm -hmm. see when this kind of factorization is possible. Um, but uh, in the most general case, you know, we assume we know almost nothing about the graph except that we can, you know, maybe it has some matching. I'll actually leave this here. So for a completely general graph, um, we don't know whether this factorization can be done. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. And I propose that we can proceed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So um, what I'm then going to do is talk about uh, claw free graphs. So you might recall that the claw is uh, we graph K13. And so claw free graph, um, so uh, the graphs that uh, we're generally considering are claw free. So the, the, the frustration graphs in particular are claw free. Uh, so line graphs are always claw free from the first slide that we saw, or one of the first slides that we saw. Um, and so uh, one uh, sort of important property of line graphs is that matchings of the root graph, so matchings in the root graph map to independent sets of the line graph. So if I have a K matching, an independent set is a set of non-neighboring, mutually non-neighboring vertices. Um, and uh, a K, or sorry, an L matching, say, the set of L non-incident edges. So it's well-known fact that uh, under the line graph mapping, this set of edges is mapped to a set of non-neighboring vertices. Um, and then sort of as a kind of like uh, parallel observation to the, the observation that matching symmetric differences form uh, cycles, the symmetric difference um, of independent sets is in a claw free graph. Uh, is a bipartite graph of degree less than or equal to two. And so maybe it's clear that it's bipartite from the fact that it's the uh, symmetric difference of two independent sets. Two of each independent set of the coloring class. And it must be degree less than two, uh, otherwise you have a claw. Um, so this narrows down the metric difference of independent sets um, to being uh, strictly either isolated vertices um, uh, paths uh, or even holes. So an even hole is uh, one whose um, it is a cycle with, uh, again, no uh, edges in the cycle besides the ones that are strictly in the cycle. It's an induced cycle. And uh, even because uh, it must be bipartite. Um, so now I'm just going to show uh, that actually this relationship that I kind of needed to cheat and use the parity symmetry property for above actually extends generally um, to claw free graphs. So let me make a new page for myself. 
right? So for example, let's consider a particular graph. Um, so let me This is the frustration graph of the four fermion model. And um, so this is the four fermion frustration graph, say. Okay, and let's pick two of its independent sets. So let's take, say, this one. Um, the vertices in this set are neighboring. And uh, let's see. That's right. So pick this next blue one. Um, so we can see that uh, the uh, independent sets induce a path. The symmetric difference of independent sets, these, these independent sets are non-overlapping. They induce a path, um, which again has even many vertices because uh, I've chosen them to be the same size and uh, therefore odd many edges. And so uh, let's consider the commutator. So in general, I'm actually going to define uh, or consider the commutator of anything. Uh, I'm going to define the independent set charges. Q sub j indexed by j. So Q sub j um, are the sum. So remember that to each vertex is associated a particular operator. So this will be like H1, say, H2, H3. It's the frustration graph of a model. Um, so this is going to be the sum of S in the set of independent sets. Uh, say S independent sets where the size of S is J. So S consists of J vertices. S is a subset of vertices. And then um, the term similar to how we defined our matching uh, operator above um, is the product over all vertices in the independent set uh, with X and K present. So, um, Right, so the terms uh, here uh, will generally not commute with each other, but uh, what I'll just quickly show is that the independent set charges themselves do commute and also commute with the Hamiltonian. So also, yeah, right. So note that Q sub one is the sum of all products of one term uh, from the Hamiltonian. So Q sub one is actually the Hamiltonian itself. And Q sub zero or Q zero uh, is by convention chosen to be the identity. Um, so we're going to show that the uh, commutator between two independent set charges, QJ and Q say L uh, vanish. And so what we can do, and this is, what I want to show, so I'm not going to assume it for now. Um, what we can do is first expand um, the independent set charges sum as two pairs of independent sets S and S prime, where S has size J, 
uh, and S prime has size L. Uh, we're also going to assume J is not equal to L because if they are, then they trivially commute. Um, and then uh, the commutator is between these products. So say K S H K K in S prime H K. Well, K, I don't want to use the letters. So K L M in S prime H M. Okay, so if these terms um, anti commute, so if they commute, then this term vanishes. And what we're then going to show is that uh, for any pair of terms in this double sum, which uh, is non vanishing, in other words, for which the products anti commute, um, then there's a corresponding canceling term, uh, which is due to the Clawfrey, you know, the details of the Clawfrey graph structure. So, um, so suppose uh, that, um, and so I'll define this as H of S, and this is H of S prime. So suppose uh, HS, HS prime. So if they anti commute, then uh, this is given by 2 HS, HS prime. And so up to a constant, um, this uh, product is um, given by the product of all factors in the symmetric difference of the two. And so the reason for that is that um, note that within each factor of HS, HS prime, uh, all of the factors, the vertex factors commute with each other. So what I can do, um, you know, just to make sure that things in the intersection of S and S prime are not going to contribute, I can commute them to kind of the center, uh, cancel them and bring out a coefficient to the front, um, not cancel them, square them and bring out a coefficient to the front. Um, so uh, what's left over, is uh, the a factor of um, the set difference of uh, s prime from s times the set difference of s from s prime, and uh, up to a sign that's that's this uh, product of all the factors within the symmetric difference. And then, as we've said, um, the symmetric difference of any pair of independent sets in the graph always induces a path, um, a bipartite path. Or, sorry. Uh, a subgraph of degree at most two. Um, now note uh, that if I have a degree of, um, sorry, a graph of degree at most two, then when I commute one independent set in that graph through the other one, then uh, the sign factor that I pick up is the parity of the number of edges in the graph. Let me write that down. So. Um, so HS, say HS prime is minus one times, and I'll call this the size of E S symmetric difference with S prime, H prime S, HS prime with HS. So uh, this is an important relationship. And you can see the reason for this is say, um, I tried to commute H, uh, the blue subset through the red subset. So um, H2 neighbors both H1 and H3 and no other elements of the set. Um, so it commutes, uh, maybe the other degree two factors also commute. Um, and then finally this degree one factor only neighbors, this degree one factor here, only neighbors uh, one degree, uh, one red vertex. So um, essentially each, because the graph is bipartite, each uh, vertex sees in one coloring class acquires a phase for each edge. And so commuting them through, uh, commuting the coloring classes through counts the number of uh, edges. I might have said that this is due to the fact that if it's of degree of most two, but it's because it's bipartite. So um, what this is saying is that, uh, if these anti-commute, 
then there must be at least one path of odd length, or at least one component um, of odd many edges. So even holes have even many edges, and uh, you know paths of even many edges don't contribute. So we must consider uh, that there, or there must be at least one path of odd length, odd many edges. And so, and in general, there must be odd many such paths. Um, so suppose that there's a path P. P, or rather let P be this path, um, which is a subset of the graph, a subset, vertex subset of the graph. P S S S S prime like this. And uh, the length of P, uh, yeah, when I say length, I mean the number of edges. So I should say P, if P is a vertex subset, I think I want to say it this way is odd. And so then this gives this. So H of S, I can break into uh, H of S minus P times H of S intersection with P. H of S prime, H of S prime minus P, H S prime intersection with P. And so this minus sign is a set difference. So um, I can basically partition the factors of H the best into the factors which are in P and the factors which are not in P. And so the factors which are in P are the ones that I've pulled out to the right. Um, and so this gives, uh, so now uh, just consider exchanging um, the red and blue subsets in this picture. So, uh, because the only neighbors to the blue subset from the red subset are in this path that when I exchange uh, the vertices only in this path, um, performing that exchange gives me another pair of independent sets. And it also gives me another pair of independent sets which are anti-commuting because there's again another, and in general, uh, odd many um, paths of odd length. So we'll define, uh, S tilde as S minus the path plus S prime intersection with the path C. So in other words, I'm exchanging the vertices uh, between uh, S and S prime only within this path. And so there's another unique term, well, there's a term in this series. Oops, maybe made that too big. Who's, uh, which is given by S and S prime tilde. So um, I'll just consider the terms given by HS, HS prime plus HS tilde. HS tilde prime. Since both of these anti commute, uh, I get a factor of HS, HS, oops, HS prime plus H tilde, H tilde prime. And then I perform this uh, decomposition. So I have H, I'll pull the S minus P, sorry, the S intersection P terms. Out the out of the right. So this is H S intersection with P, and then the S prime intersection with P terms out of the left because everything in these factors commutes. So call this H prime intersection with P, and then H S prime. The other term has the same. Oops, H S prime minus P. The other term has the same. Uh, factors of S intersection with P and S prime with the intersection of P, but in an opposite order. So I'm 
at left with the anti-commutator of H intersection with P, H S prime intersection with P, H S prime intersection with P. This, by the fact that the path has odd length, is zero. Um, now, uh, recall that I said that I assume that uh, J and L are not equal. So uh, this odd length path component, because it has even many vertices and the same number of vertices in each coloring class, uh, cannot be the only path component uh, in the symmetric difference. Um, because otherwise, the sets are equal, because that would mean that every other vertex occurs in both sets. Uh, the set sizes are equal, I should say. Um, so since J and L are not equal, uh, this is this path I've say the path that I've drawn is not the only path component of the graph G S S prime S O plus S prime, and uh, so um, therefore S minus B and S prime minus B are not empty. And uh, additionally, um, I can uniquely choose um, S tilde and S prime tilde because um, I can say, given a subset of paths that are shared by a collection of terms in the sum, I can fix a fiducial path and choose to always exchange if that path occurs in the in the sum symmetric difference in that symmetric difference, always exchange uh, the uh, terms within that sum. So, uh, sorry, always exchange the terms within that path. So I can, for each S S prime, uniquely pair it to another S tilde S prime tilde. And uh, so we see that the terms cancel pairwise. And so uh, yeah, I'll just say, can uniquely pair. terms cancel pairwise. And therefore, these charges always, as I called it, J and L. J and L always anti commute, or always commute. Um, right, so notice that this is only, the only property we needed uh, to prove this um, is in term, is the claw-free graph property of, of the frustration graph. So uh, this is true of all claw-free graphs, or all claw-free frustration graphs, G of H. And notice also that um, because G, so, or sorry, because Q1 is the Hamiltonian itself, uh, this implies that there is a set of commuting conserved charges uh, for the Hamiltonian uh, of sort of extensively growing size. Now, if the Hamiltonian is very highly anti commuting, um, suppose the Hamiltonian is a click, the Hamiltonian's frustration graph is a click, um, then it isn't extensively growing. So uh, in that case, uh, the maximum independent set size is one, but uh, the Hamiltonian can say have arbitrary size. Um, but in sort of most kind of like physically local instances that we're interested in, um, the, the size of the independent set will grow with the size of the Hamiltonian. The, the connectivity of the Hamiltonian we generally don't want to grow as we make the Hamiltonian larger, or if it does grow, we can approximate it um, by one that uh, for which the connectivity doesn't grow because we expect maybe long range terms to die off quickly. Um, uh, this is me. important. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if, if you still hear the frustration graphs are lying. Uh, lying no, so yeah, sorry. So maybe I'm uh, yeah. I, I missed that this, point a little this bit. This important point, I guess, yeah. Right, so um, I'm sorry, I did probably speed through that. So uh, 
The only thing I've assumed up to here is that the graph is claw free. Um, and that started probably mm -hmm. around this point. Um, so uh, the reason um, so one, I guess, like reason I need to consider independent sets um, instead of matching is that there's no longer necessarily a, a root graph I can assign uh, to a given frustration graph. So there's no longer right. an so, edge so there's no Okay, th there's no relation to matching any longer. Yeah, right. You just, well, you just consider independent set. Uh, is it correct? That's right. So what I've and actually then, done is I've said, Right, matchings map to independent sets under the line graph mapping. Um, and then I'm going to just say, or, or ask, uh, you know, how much can I relax the assumptions that I've made about line graphs um, to kind of general graphs, or in this case, plot free graphs, which are, uh, you know, we think of as a, an interest, very interesting generalization of line graphs. Um, and so now my questions have to be phrased in terms of independent sets rather than the matchings. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. Um, and yeah, and I'll just also remark that uh, the fact that we needed um, this degree two property of uh, symmetric difference of independent sets, um, that's a really uh, useful property for uh, lots of applications for graph theory of claw free graphs. Um, I think the most uh, well known example is uh, finding a maximal independent set in a claw free graph. Um, so, right, so I think it's just very interesting that these ideas from kind of computer science uh, and pure mathematics come into uh, this proof. Um, but but so, at this moment, you still haven't shown that uh, the spectrum is free. Right. For, um, you, you just showed so, that there exists, in, let's say, extensive amount of conserv conserv conservation laws, but not, not yet to see that the, the spectrum is, 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 is like free fermions yet, right? Right. Uh -huh. That's right. Okay. Um, and most likely, I won't be able to get to the entire calculation for why the spectrum mm -hmm. is free fermion, but uh, I can certainly, um, without giving the entire proof, uh, just write down exactly what the results are um, and maybe sketch some of the, the proof uh, directions. So, so uh, sorry, just let me. Uh, ask one, one more small question no because um, usually we know that, I mean, for free fermions, we expect there will be some kind of Fafian structure mm -hmm. appearing. But here, That's as you right. said, there's there's not necessarily a, a root graph. So uh, why, it, in a sense that, uh, how, how come it, it, it is still free fermions? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, at the moment, I don't really have a, a very rigorous answer uh, for that question, but um, what I can say is there's something very special about uh, the fact that um, I guess I, I should, something is very important about this property that the independent set symmetric differences uh, uh, at most degree two. Um, so fermions are, uh, I guess, very dependent on like the existence of a free fermion solution is very dependent on kind of like the Z2 structure of the Hamiltonian in, in a way. Um, so in the case of line graphs, um, there's kind of a nice coincidence between the fact that uh, the Hamiltonian terms only commute or anti-commute, so that's a, a, Z, a type of Z2 uh, dependence, and also the fact that there's at most two fermions per term. Um, so essentially, there's only one way that, in the line graph case, two fermion terms can anti-commute. Um, so that really reduces the options. So here, um, you know, uh, essentially, there's something very special about the fact that the options that you have um, when things anti-commute are reduced uh, to be at most, you know, say something having to do with uh, a degree two. Um, structure, but I, I can't really give a terribly rigorous answer at the moment. That's an interesting question, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. And then um, there was one more thing I wanted to just quickly mention. Ah, right. So um, you'll possibly recall that the frustration graph 
uh, of this Fenley model is actually a forbidden subgraph or contains uh, forbidden subgraphs. Um, so, you know, uh, this is sort of, uh, I guess, an interesting property of, of models with these, you know, non-line graph uh, structure. So, okay, so the next graph theoretic structure I just want to quickly talk about is what's called a simple click. Um, so simple click uh, is a click. So this is a bit of a departure from what we've been talking about so far. Um, but it's a click whose uh, K such that for every vertex in K, Uh, the neighborhood to V is the union of two clicks. So let's say that uh, the neighborhood to V is called gamma sub V or gamma of V is the union of two clicks. Or similarly, equivalently, uh, gamma sub v minus k itself is a click. All right, so here we have an example. Um, the uh, the um, orange highlighted edge here is a simple click of this graph, which is also forbidden subgraph of, of line graph. Um, and it's um, neighborhood of say the leftmost vertex is a click, which is a blue is a blue shaded edge. Um, and then similarly, the right vertex is, uh, is uh, its neighborhood is also a click, which is also the, the this edge here. And uh, so note that this this uh, does not require the click to be disjoint. So um, one important property of line graph. So for line graph, every uh, click in the graph decomposition I'll call it the cross partitioning. Is simple goal. So each fermion essentially belongs to a simple click. And uh, I will just draw maybe another graph. So This is the line graph from the last lecture. And so I'll just say that um, we also need to define something called a simplical mode. And so this is a Cowley or a generalized uh, Clifford operator. So an operator chi uh, not present in the original Hamiltonian. So it's a bit fictitious, but it's important for combinatorial bookkeeping. Uh, 
uh, but anti commute, which anti commute. Um, with all operators in a simple click of the graph. So for example, um, I could define, say, a graph, sorry, a mode chi, uh, which anti-commutes with these three red vertices. And so uh, note that the click in this graph, the click that I've chosen, um, which is this orange click now, uh, is um, you know, each of the neighbors of the red vertices in this orange click is either an edge uh, or there are no neighbors to it uh, outside of the click. Um, so this orange click is simplical and I could just assign chi to be um, to be that one. Um, so then, uh, because this is a line graph, uh, under the free fermion mapping, so this is still a line graph after attaching chi to it. Um, and so under the free fermion uh, solution mapping, I would be a another edge that is incident to the same click as this triangle. So for example, I believe it's there. So this thing is now chi. And it's as though I've introduced a fictitious fermion, um, which I guess I can call gamma zero, um, that uh, chi is the way that gamma zero attaches to the rest of the graph. Um, and so actually this gives us a way to recover uh, the jordan Wigner transformation, which is a definition of uh, the individual fermion modes. Um, so if you'll recall, the line graph mapping um, defines the uh, fermions in terms of quadratics. Um, sorry, yeah, so it takes the Hamiltonian terms um, to quadratics in the fermion, uh, but it doesn't have an explicit definition of uh, the um, the single fermion modes. But notice that uh, if I uh, choose to just say attach gamma zero to every uh, fermion mode in a pair like this, then that actually satisfies the same algebra as um, the original pair of fermions or the original uh, single fermion. So this is the same as gamma j gamma k. Um, because so for j and k not equal to zero, so uh, j anti commutes with zero, but zero also anti commutes with k. Um, so you have those, those minus signs cancel, uh, and then zero commutes with itself. And so the only um, phase factor that's left over is whether or not gamma j and gamma k anti commute. Um, so essentially, what you can do is add this sort of fictitious mode and uh, to recover the definition of gamma j, I simply, uh, so suppose this is j, I simply take the product of all edge operators along some fiducial path uh, from gamma zero out to gamma j. So if I called this, oops, I called this say one, two, three, then I define, you know, gamma j, by sort of dropping um, the gamma zero from the product. So I take uh, define that by mapping chi, I'll call this H sub one, two, whatever that Hamiltonian term is. 
times h sub two three. And so under the free fermion solution, uh, the interior Hamiltonian terms cancel, uh, the interior Majorana modes cancel, and then chi is mapped to gamma zero, gamma one, and so that also cancels. So I end up with a gamma zero times gamma j, and then in the algebra, I can just drop it. Um, so uh, this allows us to recover the jordan Wigner transformation and remember that it doesn't actually matter which path we choose. Um, so if I, I decided to multiply gamma zero by Hamiltonian terms out to gamma j, uh, but I could have chosen a different path and these paths would only differ by a cycle. Um, and since the cycle is a symmetry of the Hamiltonian um, over a symmetric subspace, uh, these operators are equivalent. And so uh, the simple mode you can kind of think of as a type of boundary which locally defines um, a Majorana mode, but that sort of local definition uh, can be recursively um, sort of expanded to give a definition to, to give a, a definition of all the Majorana modes. Um, so while this maybe looks a little bit trivial in the line graph picture, it turns out that, that something to this effect will also extend to the general qua even whole free graph picture. Um, okay, so I think I've built quite a bit of machinery for uh, how to think about the, this, uh, these more general qua free graphs and how they relate to line graphs. Um, so uh, right now at the state, what our main result from uh, the paper that I'm talking about today is. Um, so uh in our paper free fermions behind the disguise uh we gave a graph theoretic characterization for when a model is solvable in the same framework as the uh for fermion model originally introduced by Fenley um and so this this uh graph theoretic characterization basically gives so I'll just state our main theorem um Free fermion solution is possible. If the graph, uh, if G of H is even whole claw free. In the paper, I believe we give this in two, uh, we state this in two theorems, um, but this is the, the main result. And there are sort of two, uh, two different parts to it. Um, so this figure basically shows, okay, so uh, the graphs um, K13 and even holes, which are denoted C2K for K, uh, an integer greater than one um are forbidden induced subgraphs for this class of graphs and uh so you'll notice that it says here that a typical click is included uh but it turns out that this is actually always the case um so this was proven uh recently in a paper called a note on typical clicks by um Ray Chodnowski, paul seymour uh sophie spherical and alexander scott um and uh basically uh, well, actually, so um, originally when we wrote this paper, we needed three assumptions uh, to show that the, the free fermion solvability method given by Fenley uh, generalizes this way. Um, but we asked these authors uh, whether or not uh, the typical click assumption was redundant uh, to the other two, um, because we couldn't actually find a counterexample to that. Um, and so they ended up writing a uh, you know a very nice paper uh, proving that in fact a more general class of graphs, um, which includes even whole claw free graphs, satisfies um, uh, includes a simple whole click. So it actually turns out that B and C, uh, the assumptions that uh, claw and even holes are forbidden, actually implies A. Um, a simple click is always included in an even whole claw free graph. Um, so uh, that's rather nice. And uh, kind of the machinery of this um, is very related to what I just spoke about. So um, the first thing that we need is to basically show 
that this um, what looks like an independent, sorry, a characteristic polynomial factorization. So let me just back up. Um, analog of the characteristic polynomial. is following. So we have these transfer matrices. I'm going to now subscript them by the graph G. Um, and so they uh, satisfy an operator factorization. I should say what the transfer matrix is actually first. So the transfer matrix of the graph G is now defined as the sum of all uh, overall independent sets. So uh, I'm going to say this is S from zero to alpha, the independence number of the graph, um, minus U to the S, QS. And uh, our analog is that T of U, now dropping the graph, um, satisfies a operator factorization of the vertex weighted independence polynomial. So this is the independence polynomial with vertex weight. And that is equal to the sum of all independent sets. Times the product of j, sorry, with a coefficient. Uh, so in this case, it's K minus U squared to the K times the product of all J and S times H B J squared. So uh, B sub J is the coupling coefficient on the term H sub J. Um, so this is the weight on the uh, Hamiltonian term and it comes in with a square. So we see interestingly that the signs are not uh, relevant to uh, the independence uh, vertex weighted independence polynomial. And um, additionally, um, uh, the dependence is only on independent sets as opposed to what we had before, which was there was a cycle contribution. Um, and kind of intuitively, you can see the reason there's no cycle contribution uh, is that we've actually assumed the graph has no holes. So uh, while you know odd holes will generally not contribute, um, you have to assume that there's no even holes. And what you'll find if you uh, if you don't assume that is that you get a correction due to even holes. Um, so uh, what we did is we recognize this as the independence polynomial of the graph, and it's also well known that the independence polynomial of a of a line graph is the matching polynomial of its root graph. Um, so similarly. Uh, when we are adding a root of the independence polynomial, um, this implies that uh, T becomes non-invertible. I should also say that because the Q sub S all commute with each other, um, T of U and T of minus U commute, and in fact, T at general values of U commute with each other. Um, so, right, so it's, it's you know, it's safe to say that T becomes singular uh, at a root of, of P. Um, and then, so the root or the single particle energies of the uh, Hamiltonian even by or are related to the roots of U. 
roots of p of g. And uh, so this gives the single particle energies, the eigenmodes of the Hamiltonian. Uh, well, I should say the raising and lowering operators. Make sure that I stated this correctly. Are given by. Psi, um, and up to a normalization constant is given by T of G minus U sub J, where U sub J is the J root of the vertex weighted independence polynomial T of G of U of J. And yeah, so P of G minus U sub J squared is zero. And um, Right, so uh, it's kind of an interesting, uh, not coincidence, but it's an interesting remark that uh, the independence polynomial of a claw-free graph has real roots. Um, so, you know, maybe you're not guaranteed actually that this polynomial, or it's not obvious that you're guaranteed a priori that this polynomial has real roots, um, which would in fact be the single particle energies of the Hamiltonian. Uh, but in this case, uh, because the graph is claw free, uh, you do have that. Um, and furthermore, the roots are um, uh, the roots of P of G of X are on the negative real axis. Um, so you're guaranteed that U has, can take a real value. Uh, and um, this, this sort of simple mode chi appears um, in order to kind of relate uh, the, um, the excited and de-excited subspaces of a single mode. And so um, what we'll see is that uh, the psi j psi J five K equals and they satisfy the fermionic ladder canonical anti commutation relations. Um, and uh, I guess I don't have time to go through proof today, but um, because anyway, it's rather long. Uh, but it's very interesting because uh, it uses. Uh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought these sides are like Majoranas. Or... So in this case, the free fermion solution is given to us in terms of the raising and lowering operators, actually. Um, oh, and uh, okay. you can construct from them the Majoranas by taking complex combinations of them. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, 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 the, so, the, so the last cell. line should be uh, psi k dagger, I presume. Oh, you're right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I see. Um, <laughs> that's right. So thank you. Um, but uh, all I was going to just say is that um, the proof is not, it, there's, uh, it's hard to gain a whole lot of intuition about uh, why this works from the proof itself. Um, but essentially, the proof. Uh, relies on comparing the recursion relations 
so there are graph theoretic recursion relations which t, both t of g and p of g satisfy. Um, and by comparing these and also noting that chi only anti commutes with things inside of a simple conflict, um, you can essentially manipulate uh, this expression to show that the commutator of Hamiltonian with this object um, is proportional to to the uh, the original raising and lowering operator up to a single particle energy. And um, finally, you need to do just a little bit more work to show that actually the uh, symmetry, sorry, so what this gives is a set of uh, fermionic matter multiplets. Um, and you also need to show that, you need to do a little bit more work to show that uh, these multiplets are actually not differing by a constant or are not, uh, or in fact are energetically degenerate. Um, so uh, generally these models come with quite a high degree of symmetry. Um, and it's still, I believe, an open question to understand where those, uh, where those symmetries come from. Um, and uh, so uh, that's all I have to say about our main results. Um, I'll just mention that from this, this might be kind of, uh, it's an imported PDF, so it might be a rather large figure. Um, so from this, you can also find new models uh, that satisfy the original uh, free fermion solution given by, given by Fenley. Um, here's an example of a model, which is kind of like a, um, a, a range four free fermion solution. I should just say that, uh, so the family of models that we're talking about, um, because while I talked about the solution method, I didn't actually write the model down, um, are given by, uh, say something from J zero to the number of spins in the Hamiltonian minus L, uh, X sub J, I believe I want to say that. So, um, Z tensor L. You do need to actually account for this boundary. So um, I won't worry about this issues for a moment, but Essentially, these are terms like x z z in the case of Semley's model. And uh, in the case of this model, you can take an extra z. And um, this gives a longer range uh, frustration graph. Um, and so uh, you can do things like calculate the dispersion relations of these models. Let me make this smaller. Um, for different values of the coupling coefficients. And one really interesting property about these models, um, so these models have also been investigated by Alcaraz and others, um, is that uh, they appear to be symmetric in the coupling coefficients, uh, as long as the, the Hamiltonian has a repeating four periodic structure. Um, so if the coupling coefficients of these four vertices are identical up to translation by unit cell, um, then uh, the Hamiltonian phase diagram appears to be symmetric under exchanges of these coupling coefficients, even though uh, there are boundaries present. Um, so, okay, it looks like uh, we're sort of at the two hour mark. Um, what I just want to say maybe to conclude is I said something about uh, how I want to motivate the theory for a more unified picture of these models. So let me just go back up to uh, that figure. Before I conclude. So what's kind of nice about uh, reducing everything to a sort of uh, simple characterization of a few axioms uh, mathematically is they sort of allow you to uh, interchange or kind of compare and contrast uh, the axiomatic framework for different solutions. Um, and so if we consider that the Jordan Wigner transformation uh, is uh, requires that the frustration graph be claw-free and, and the fermion model is also a claw-free class. Um, the, and we also note that the other assumption that these two sort of seemingly disjoint classes have in common, turns out that they are simplical. Um, it seems a natural thing to guess that the, uh, the sort of super class that contains them both uh, is a class of simplical claw-free graphs. So this is something we write down in the conclusion, I believe, of our paper. 
or claw free graph which contain a physical click. Because while we said that we needed to assume that there are no even holes, um, that assumption was uh, mostly made to uh, avoid that even hole correction, but that's not the same as saying that uh, even holes strictly forbid a free fermion solution. Um, so we expected it may be possible. In fact, we're fairly confident that it's possible to relax this assumption. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's what I, I think would be very interesting. And in fact, this is what we're investigating now, a very interesting uh, sort of new class of models to investigate. Um, and nevertheless, uh, even though uh, this, these characterizations give a wide uh, range of models, um, we expect there's still free fermion solvable models outside of this course. And uh, that includes free fermion solvable models, which don't have generic solutions in the sense that um, the fermion solvability is independent of the coupling constant. Um, so, uh, right, so that's all I have for today. So I'll just thank you again, again for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th thanks a lot for, <laughs> for giving me this great lecture. I mean, I really learned thank a lot. Um, and j just before we end the meeting, I, uh, may I ask just one small question here? Mm -hmm. um, so w what if we even relax the, you know, the requirement of uh, Simplico? Because um, you already showed that for any uh, cloud-free uh, let's say graph, frustration graph, you, you uh, obtain, uh, let's say, uh, extensive amount of commuting charges. In principle, right. you can just define like a transfer matrix like that. Uh, but would it bring us even something like with interactions or, uh, yeah, or, or, or is there some kind of examples, uh, let's say some, Okay, in this case, I, I guess it's relatively ge general because you don't assume, let's say, translational invariance or anything like this. You can have a coupling that depends on your size. Um, but would it bring to us to some kind of known integrable models in, the, in this case? Like the, all the transfer matrix resemble some kind of integrable model. Right. Uh, so, um... Uh, so the original four fermion model, Fenley's model, uh, mm -hmm. in on periodic boundary conditions, as I'm sure you're aware, mm -hmm. uh, is neither simple nor claw free actually. Um, mm -hmm. So let me just uh, draw this. Let me see if I can do a good job of drawing it. Okay. So. So the graph is maybe looks like this. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, I see something in my paper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. um, so, right. So these, you know, mm -hmm. edges are curved here, but uh, you can see that there is no simple click, if I'm not mistaken, in this graph. So I see. a single vertex um, neighbors a path of length three. So this vertex neighbors this path. Um, a single edge uh, neighbors, well, this one might be special because it's so small, but um, it looks like a single edge uh, neighbors this vertex, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking of this edge. And this vertex. Each, each vertex here neighbors, yeah, so these are not neighboring, okay. Um, and then I believe a triangle has the same property. Um, mm -hmm. So, right, so it does not contain a simple click. Um, Generally, it won't be even hole free either, uh, because mm -hmm. um, you know even if you put the model on odd periodic boundary conditions, I believe there's still a way to draw a path 
that, or rather to find a hole that is even. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I suppose it would be very surprising if this model turned out to be um, free fermion. Um, and I think we very- I think we more or less know because, not. yeah, because if we just numerically diagonalize it, the spectrum is, yeah, right. it doesn't look, even um, for a small system size, it doesn't look. Right. From uh, so, so simplical. I think it's completely open at the moment whether or not mm -hmm. uh, we can relax the simplical assumptions because, um, well, at the moment all the examples we know of are are simplical. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But I, I was more thinking about maybe if we relax this uh, condition, maybe we'll get some kind of interactive model. But possibly oh, can um, also be solved using, let's say, the transfer matrix approach because uh, this okay. They, we will not have this nice inverse uh, identity, which mm -hmm. tells us about the spectrum. But maybe it still tells us something a bit more than just diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, I presume. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really uh, mm -hmm. interesting uh, observation. I think that's probably. So again, going back to this model, um, right. So we can write down the transfer matrix. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, Factorizing the matrix product operator over periodic mm -hmm. boundary conditions. And so um, even though the model is not pre fermionic, I expect that's a pretty, mm -hmm. that'd be a pretty uh, promising way to attack it. Yeah, I see. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, let's say in the, in the, this four fermion case, uh, I presume that we we could not massage it into some kind of fermions hopping on some lattices or, or is it because it seems that this approach immediately kind of brings to some eigenmodes, but this is, I mean, we're already in the eigenmodes, you see, because previously we right. have a line graph and then we have a root graph where then we need to do, in principle, do some kind of Fourier transform to bring it into eigenmodes, right? But, but, but here, yeah. it seems that it's probably not possible, or I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think um, it's a good question. Um, to some extent, you expect the 1D structure of mm -hmm. this model to, like, it, 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 I think it depends on how you want to define mm -hmm. a local structure, um, because, um, you know, once you have the model written in an eigen basis, uh, you know, you sort of have it in every basis, in every basis with mm -hmm. the same spectrum. Um, yeah. But, right, I think your question is maybe like, what is a sensible graph to expect will have this spectrum, mm -hmm. um, a sensible graph on which the fermion top to have the spectrum. So I'll also say that sometimes it is possible to reduce mm -hmm. these uh, models exactly to um to to line graphs of course so in the case where you have these like true twin mm -hmm. uh true twin vertices here um so in that case you can remove that by a local rotation you can remove right. one of those mm -hmm. vertices by a local rotation and then it is a line graph um and in fact it's kind of interesting because uh so all of these graphs uh have at least one of these properties of true or false mm -hmm. twins. So um, uh -huh. so even though these are all forbidden subgraphs, uh, there is a way to do a unitary rotation or projection onto an eigenspace that mm -hmm. uh, shows that actually all of them have free fermion solutions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of, kind of just funny, um, but it truly is how they are wired together that's important. And I think uh, when you have uh, larger graph, yeah, it's less clear how to how to massage it. Yeah, but, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. I I wouldn't uh, take all of your sleeping time, <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, have a nice uh, uh, night. And uh, uh, thank you great. again for uh, giving these great two lectures. Um, I will email you once uh, once it will be posted, and uh, let's keep right. in touch. Yeah, thanks. Right, sure. All right, thank bye. you. All right, take care. Bye. Yeah, bye.